bringing you a video today talking about the British Army Beret. Specifically, as the title says, looking at the, the shape of the Army Beret and how it's changed over the years. The size of the crown has changed quite considerably. Uh, but we're going to have a look at some examples from my collection today and see how they've changed over time. These are issued examples which have been worn and been moulded by their former owners. Uh, and I will show them uh, to show a little bit of a, a timeline of progression and then we'll talk about some more modern examples. Certainly in, very, in recent years, I'd say from the, the late 90s, early 2000s on, um, you see a lot of uh, very interesting methods of uh, moulding berets um, in certain uh, instances. Certainly a good example is the Parachute Regiment, and we'll come on to them later on. Uh, but there is a propensity among some to tr extrapolate this sort of modern look back. Uh, and this happened in a comment recently on one of my, uh, one of my uploads on Instagram. A chap had commented saying, doesn't that beret need moulding? Um, or shrinking, something along those lines. And it was a 1950s beret, and they are a lot larger, and they're worn, just pulled down over the ear, essentially, and moulded down over the ear. Um, so that's, and that's not typical of today. A, a lot of uh, men wear, wear their berries uh, smaller, much, much smaller, and also moulded differently as well. Um, but as I say, if you look at period photographs, that's not the way it was done at the time. Uh, so there has been an evolution over the years, and we'll get into a little bit of that in the video and talk about some of the changes which have occurred. And we'll have a look at some of the examples from my collection, as I say, and obviously have a look at some more modern examples as well in photographs and so forth. The first beret we'll look at here is a 1945 dated example of the Black Beret, of course introduced in 1924, used by the Royal Tank Corps. During the course of the Second World War, on after the formation of the Royal Armoured Corps and the renaming of the Royal Tank Corps of the Royal tank regiment as part of the Royal Armoured Corps, other units would begin to wear, other armoured units would begin to wear the beret as well. And what we have here is an example of that, the Royal Armoured Corps regiment, which was drawn from a territorial battalion of the King's Own regiment, hence the King's Own badge, but in this instance it's white as opposed to brass in colour, uh, which was not uncommon um, for regiments to continue wearing their cap badge but wear a, a white version of it on the Royal Armoured Corps beret. Um, not all regiments did this, but uh, a lot did, and this is an example of that. We'll just bring this up to the camera here so you can see the markings inside. This particular example is made by Supac, as you can see there, uh, 7 and 1 8 and dated 1945. This is a very large crown beret, as they were at the time. And we'll get, the, uh, we'll get a ruler in here, a rule rather, and just have a look across the crown there. So we've got about 9.5 inches, maybe a little bit more, 9 and 3 quarters maybe. And we flip it over there. We've got about 25, 25 centimetres, thereabouts. Um, so quite a large crown. Now, the first sort of move towards a general issue beret type headdress for the British Army was the uh, GS cap, which you can see here. Now, obviously, this is not a beret in the true sense, really, but it is a a beret made from serge or earlier gabardine but latterly serge and this is a late war example this again is dated 1945 as you can see in there um, but as i say uh, not a popular headdress but this is the first step towards the army as a whole being issued something along the lines of a beret as opposed to the field service cap which had gone before and as you can see if we compare these the crown size is very similar as you can see there. So these are two second war examples, or well, they're both made in 45, so possibly didn't see use during the war. In fact, probably didn't. However, they are wartime era. They are the designs that were around at the time. Okay, so the first berry we'll talk about with me wearing it is the black berry. And as you can see here, this is worn in regulation manner, badge over the left eye, pulled down to the right. And this basically sets the pattern for how British berries will be worn going forward, much as there are variations in the way they're molded and so forth. This is the basic, the, the standard way of doing it, is how you're supposed to wear them. There are variations to this. During the Second World War in particular, it was quite fashionable to wear them on the back of the head, or something a bit like this. If I can do this with my long hair. Something a bit like that, if you could get away with it, um, or that you weren't supposed to wear them like this. The same goes for the GS cap, which we're going to look at in just a moment, which I'll mention then as well. Um, it's Basically, it was in fashion at the time. I think in the by, by the time the post-war years come around you would probably not get away with doing that same with caps flatter back in the navy um, that's quite a wartime thing uh, and falls out of fashion uh, after the war you do see it post-war 
talking about berets as well. I think it was the army would probably crack down on that sort of thing. I'm sure there are photographs out there of it being done post-war, but it definitely fell out of fashion as the, the post-war years went on. The fashion for moulding them changed quite cons considerably, and this is not particularly moulded. It just has the, the badge over the left eye and it's pulled down. You sort of got a bit of a line here. But with the big crown and everything, it just falls very low over the right ear, and there's not much more moulding done to it. One variation you will see, and talking particularly about the Black Beret here, vehicle crews and so forth wearing headsets. You'll sometimes see the badge pulled round to the centre, uh, so the berry squashes flat on either side and the badge is in the center with the headphones over so you can still see the badge whereas if you wear a headset otherwise squashing the berry down will hide the badge and you certainly see that post-war as well i've seen photographs from northern ireland of, of troops um in vehicles wearing headsets with the badge pulled around not that it was necessarily universal but some did it so again that's a variation to look out for and something perhaps to consider if you're recreating troops specifically uh, in that scenario. Uh, but again, look for photographs and that will become, uh, that point will become more important later on in the video when we talk about different regiments, different corps, wearing their berries differently and even some individuals within those wearing them differently and we'll try and look, I'll try and pull up some uh, interesting uh, variations seen in photographs over the years. But uh, we'll move on now to have a look at the GS cap. So here we have the GS cap, uh, introduced September 1943. Uh, there will then of course be a transitional period as it replace the the preceding FS cap and this is the prescribed way of wearing it badge over the left eye pulled down to the right you can't really do anything to improve the look of this uh, you often see them worn um, back on the head uh, in various other manners to try and improve the look make them look a bit more jaunty a little bit more interesting I think than what this is being in surge as I said it, it doesn't mold well um, the gabardine wasn't much better uh, but this was the, the first sort of standard issue beret type headdress, although I don't think you can really class this as a beret itself. It's the first step towards the general issue of berets in the British Army. So there we have the uh, GS cap. The first photograph we'll look at here shows men of the, I believe, 4th Royal Tank Regiment in 1939. Quite a famous photograph, this, um, practicing with their pistols. And you can see here the berry is essentially worn in the prescribed manner, cap badge over the left eye, pulled down to the right. There's some different uh, levels of shaping here. Uh, some of the men have shaped the berries more than others, but it's a good example of the how the berry was worn at this time. We have a couple more tankies here later in the war, and you can see the chap on the left is wearing the berry essentially in the same manner, cap badge over the left eye, pulled down to the right. But the chap on the right gives a nice example of the cap badge worn basically at the centre of the forehead, and you can see the berry is a bit more shaped down on each side. Next we have a photograph showing the GS cap being worn in various different ways. Some of the men here are wearing it essentially as it should be, with the cap badge over the left eye pulled down to the right, but others are wearing it more on the back of the head. It's an excellent photograph to give them a nice overview of some of the different ways in which the GS cap was worn all in one photo. So the next berry we'll have a look at here is a 50s dated example, 1951, Kangol. Again, this is a seven and a quarter, so a slightly larger uh, size in the band, but as we compare it here, the crown, the reason for re leaving the wartime Royal Army Corps, the crown is uh, essentially the same, in fact slightly larger on the blue beret, but that's understandable because obviously it's a slightly larger size in the, uh, the band as well. This is badged obviously to the Mersion uh, Brigade, the reason for, for that is um, the reason for that is that this was used recently uh, with a battle dress badged, uh, the Cheshire's part of the Merchant Brigade at the time. There were some idle fluffs here, sorry about that. Um, problem of having a cat in the house. Uh, the beret is basically the same size, the manuf manufacturer is very similar, obviously we have eyelets here, though they're actually slightly further around to the, the front of the beret rather than being right at the side here, but otherwise the manufacturer is very similar indeed. Um, and this is worn in a very similar manner, shaped in a very similar manner to those worn during the Second World War. Uh, so the crown is still very large on 50s manufactured berets, and as we'll see in a minute, that tends to follow through to the 60s, but we'll have a look at this worn now. So here we have the Midnight Blue Beret, uh, introduced around 1948. Um, certainly there are articles discussing its introduction at that point, and we have here, this is with the cap badge of the Mersion Brigade, so this is for wear in the, in the 1960s, the early 1960s, and 50s berets were certainly still on issue that, by that point, they were made in large numbers and issued out as needed. And this is moulded to a degree, uh, moulded down over the right ear. Um, it's worn in a very similar manner. There's a little bit of moulding at the top here, just to, to give the badge some support. But otherwise, it's not heavily moulded and it is just pulled down. It's not pulled forward or anything like that, as you see on more modern 
times, which we'll get into later in the video. And this is worn pretty much through the 50s in this manner and into the 1960s. Um, and it's then into the 70s you see the crown reduced in size and we'll get into all of that uh, going forward. But this is for the 1950s and 60s, fairly typical. Um, and as I say, uh, looking at period photographs, which we'll look at in just a moment, it's fairly typical to see berets worn like this. I have another period photograph here, and this is from the 1950s, in fact. So looking at the, the beret as worn in the 1950s, and you can see here men departing to sail to Korea. And they essentially have the beret worn much as we saw before, just with the cap badge over the left eye and, and somewhat shaped to fall down over the right ear neatly. There's not a huge amount more moulding going on to the crown there, uh, but an example of how they were worn in the 1950s. So we have a 60s era airborne beret here, 1964. We'll bring this up here. This one's a Compton and Webb example, uh, seven and one eighth again, 1964, as you can see there, nice and clearly stamped. Thank you very much again to Alan for this. Um, it was a, a recent gift for my birthday this year, so thank you very much indeed for that, Alan. It's a lovely example. Uh, this has been more, much more heavily moulded, as you can probably see, um, but when worn, it looks quite similar, but you'll see the differences, the way it's been moulded to give a better support for the cap badge and so forth. But it's still a very large crown. If we put this over the 50s example, you can see there's actually not that much difference there in terms of size. Um, it's it's really not much, there's not much in it. It's still a very large crown beret. We've not yet seen the, the shrinking in size that would come a little bit later on. Uh, as I say, this is a 60s example. So in the 60s, the crown is still being manufactured quite a, a, a large size, quite wide. We'll have a look now at uh, me wearing this just to show how it's been shaped. Okay, so here we have the 60s airborne beret and a little bit more moulding going on in this case, although we still have the large crown coming right down over the, the, the ear there, as you can see. We've got a bit more of moulding, uh, a bit more of the moulding going on behind the badge here to give the badge a bit more support and a more distinct line of moulding across the front here. So it has been moulded more heavily than the one we previously looked at, but as I say, still got that large crown coming right down over the ear here. Appropriately, we have a photograph here of men of the Parachute Regiment, which was taken in the 1960s. And you can see here the berries have been moulded in a very similar manner to the one that I showed, uh, with an area to support the cap badge and then the crown moulded neatly down over the right ear. For interest, we have another photograph here from the 1960s of two men uh, training in Cyprus. The chap on the left, although apparently not wearing a cap badge, has the beret moulded in essentially the same manner as we've just looked at. But the chap to the right is wearing his beret in a manner which is quite peculiar, seemingly to the 1960s and in certain situations. He's pulled the moulded section of the beret round to provide shade for the eyes, a bit like a peaked cap. And it looks very much like that in the photograph. This was also done by Royal Marines in Borneo, it's noted. And it seems to be quite peculiar to the 1960s and certain situations. So not typical, but an interesting variation to have a look at. And this is quite a good example of it here. So the next beret we're going to look at is a late 70s, 80s example, I think, judging from the contract number. This is for, obviously has a Remy beret badge. It's as I bought it. Um, we have a look at the label here. It's a seven and one eighth again in size. Uh, we have the NATO stock number underneath there, if it'll, it'll focus properly. Obviously we now have the plastic insert in the top as well. Um, Compton headdress and gloves limited. And then the contract number underneath that. Uh, much smaller in the crown, which you can probably tell just by looking between these two. Um, if the camera will focus again, there we go. Uh, simplified manufacturing that we no longer have the eyelets under the side of it there. You no longer have ventilation eyelets. And in this instance, we have a cloth sweat band rather than leather. You do see leather as well. So that's a very manufacturing variation, I would say, more than anything else. Um, if I just move the airborne beret out of the way, uh, just because it is moulded so heavily, this gives a better idea of crown, the blue beret here. Put that down there and just compare. And you can see there that the difference in size is quite marked. Um, it really is a lot smaller. Uh, I'll just move these all out of the way now. And we'll get a quick measurement of this across the crown. Um, so we've got about nine inches across there. It's not quite square round. So yeah, just around nine inches. And then we've got uh, about 23, 23 centimeters or so, 23 and a half, something around there. So a lot smaller um, in the crown. Uh, this has been moulded to give quite a lot of support to the, the beret badge, the way it's been moulded previously, and you'll see that when I uh, show you uh, myself wearing it now. Okay, so here we have the 70s Remy beret, and it's around this time, as I said, you see the crown reduce quite a bit in, in size, uh, and you've obviously got quite quite heavy moulding going on here. Again, we've got the line down over the, the front here. The peak's been pulled forward a little bit more. We still have the divot in behind the badge there to give it some support. 
this is probably doing a little bit of a disservice because my hair is a bit long at the moment due to the situation we're in at present working on that um so it's a little bit uh, puffed up on top of my head here and i think it would sit closer to the head if my hair were a bit shorter but there we go um this is a sort of time period in the 70s and into the 80s certainly that you see different forms of moulding and sometimes within regiments the parachute regiment of the Falklands is a good example of this you see lots of different shapes of berets it's at this point you really begin to need to look at the core or regiment you're trying to emulate and you're trying to recreate to make sure you're moulding within this the sort of uh, different methods they were using uh, to mould berets we'll have a look at some period photographs showing different shapes and so forth now uh, but as I say at this time frame and onwards you need to begin to look at the uh, different shapes and things that you'll see uh, actually worn uh, by men at the time uh, and try and replicate those when you're moulding the beret to, to get it to be accurate. We'll move on now to have a look at some photographs from the Falklands and we can see here first of all men of the Royal Army Ordnance Corps who are wearing berries which have been moulded in a somewhat laissez-faire manner. They've been pulled down over the right ear but there's not been a huge amount more moulding done to the crown from what can be seen. Uh, in contrast we have this famous photograph of the Scots Guards on Tumbledown and we have several different variations, uh, two in particular of note in terms of moulding the beret in this photograph. The chap in the foreground has moulded his beret uh, down to the right but also forward as well, whereas the chaps in the background have moulded it more akin to what we've seen before with an area moulded up to support the cap badge and then the crown pulled down to the right, uh, creating that neat crease across the front. Another example from the parachute regiment here, and this chap has essentially moulded his beret in a similar manner to the chaps in the background of the previous photograph with an area supporting the cap badge and then the crown moulded down to the right. There are various different other ways of moulding the berry seen um, members of the parachute regiment in the Falklands and there's a nice photograph here which shows that quite uh, distinctly. Of particular interest is the chap third from the right who has uh, similar to the Scots Guardsman in the foreground in the previous photographs uh, who has pulled the front of the beret forward and then over to the right, um, again giving a sort of a peak over the front of the, uh, the forehead. And this, as we'll see in the next photograph here, in a modern context, has become something of a staple for the parachute regiment. It's become a very much a, a regimental way of moulding the beret in recent years. And again, this is an important point during this period, is to look at photographs and try and work out how a particular regiment, how a particular corps do things, or if it varies. And the next photograph we'll look at here is an example again taking it right back round to uh, Tankies, the Royal Tank Regiment here and you can see within this photograph several different ways of moulding the beret um, but again the the basic pattern is uh, cap badge over the left eye pulls down to the right but there are variations within that. There we are that's a brief run through of a sort of a little bit of a chronology of, of the wearing of the beret by the British Army and how the, the way it's been shaped and the size of the crown etc is changed over the years. In terms of recreating service personnel in terms of reenacting uh, I think it's important uh, to look at period photographs, try and extrapolate how kit was worn um, in, as a rule from those photographs, try and work out what the general rule was in terms of uniform and equipment. Uh, and as I say, that will generally give you a, a good start on getting it right. Um, there will always be exceptions, of course, but reenacting the rule is generally preferable. Uh, but that's what I've tried to do here is I've, when I've put the berets on, I've worn them as I've seen in period photographs. Uh, and I've, obviously, as I say, they are original and have been moulded by their former owners. So I'm basically wearing them as they came to me in the way they've been moulded. Um, so as I say, that's a, a good rule of thumb. Uh, and, and as you'll see, if you're recreating anything particularly modern, there are various different ways of moulding berets. So you'll want to try and get it right for your specific uh, regiment or core. But uh, I hope you found that interesting, as I always say. Uh, if you have and you'd like to see more from the channel, then please do consider subscribing if you haven't already. And whether you've already subscribed or you're newly subscribing, please do make sure you've hit the little bell, the little notification button down below. This will, of course, alert you when I upload future videos. If you really like my uploads and you'd like to support the channel, you can. There is both a Patreon link and a PayPal link down below. You can support me through those. And those who do, thank you very much indeed. As ever, it's greatly appreciated. The, the support for the channel is always very much appreciated. There is also social media as well. There's Facebook, Instagram and Twitter all linked down below. And if you want to contact me but you don't really use social media, there is, of course, an email address as well. But that's everything for this video. So until next time, bye for now.